Oklahoma. And thank you for joining us. Special thank you to our ASL interpreter for today, Joel Guidry. My name is Dr. Brent Jones, and I'm the superintendent of Seattle Public Schools. And we're here to talk about health and safety. With me today, I'd like to have a warm welcome to Director for Student Support Services, Dr. Carrie Nicholson, Assistant Deputy Superintendent of Strategy Deployment and Responsiveness, Carrie Campbell, Assistant for Deputy Assistant Deputy Superintendent of Strategy and Deployment and Responsiveness, Dr. Sarah Pritchett, for joining me today to share our updates and answer questions on creating healthy and safe learning environments for this school year. I'm also happy to share that we've reached a tentative agreement with our Seattle Education Association to support layered COVID-19 health and safety strategies to protect our schools and communities. The agreement exceeds state health recommendations, including family education around staying home when sick, including communication in multiple languages, clear alignment on safety measures through the district through active building safety teams, and high quality airflow and HVAC upgrades to ensure air quality exceeds accepted standards. This also includes additional mitigation in rooms with high transmission risk, including a designated healthcare room, band, and choir. Lastly, masking requirements for students that address safety throughout the school day. With these strong protocols in place, I'm excited to welcome students back to full-time in-person learning and kick off 180 days of excellence. We are making key improvements to ensure your students' experience is excellent with a focus on high quality instruction and creating the learning conditions for our students to thrive, a focus on a culture of care and building healthy and safe environments for the mental, emotional, and physical well being of our entire SPS community, and a focus on responsiveness and partnering with students families and their staff to also meet their social, emotional, and educational needs. We are also continuing to center the health and safety of our students, staff, and community. And to do that, we must follow the guidance of state and local health authorities. They are the experts, and we will partner with them to use science-based strategies to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. These protocols are layered and together they're going to help create safe and healthy school buildings. These include masking, physical distancing, cleaning, disinfecting, hand washing, ventilation, COVID-19 testing, required staff vaccination, and contact tracing in partnership with Public Health, King County, and Seattle. However, we know that if COVID transmission rates increase significantly in our community and region, our schools and district could be affected. I also want to recognize the concern and fear that families and staff may be feeling about the COVID Delta variant. Now we are legally required and proud to offer full-time in-person learning for all students interested in learning this year. While I have the authority as superintendent to close school or schools on a temporary basis in case of an emergency, the ultimate authority for returning to 100% remote learning is with the state. So I, along with our staff, will work in close partnership with the state and local policymakers as we monitor our transmission rates. I promise you that this is not a delegation of responsibility, but rather a system of accountability to ensure we are working in partnership with experts on science-based decisions for our communities. We are here to support you and have provided posted state approved virtual learning options for those who are unable to participate in our virtual option pilot program. So now uh, I'll pass it over to Dr. Carrie Nicholson, who will share more about our layered mitigation strategy to support the health and safety of our students, staff and community. Carrie. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Um, as Dr. Jones just mentioned, my name is Carrie Nicholson and I'm the Interim Director of Health Policy Procedures and Practices. 
I've been informing the district on all things COVID since the virus began emerging in our community back in February 2020. Over the past 18 months, we have built a strong foundation for going forward into this next school year. This foundation is comprised of the personal and collective lessons that we have learned through the pandemic. And it's deeply rooted in our strong commitment to following the science and guidance from our state and local health officials. It's supported through the continual consultation of public health, Seattle and King County, and it's strengthened through our collaboration across our departments and communities and organizations. We have positioned ourselves to be flexible and we are prepared when there are any changes in the guidance to adjust. And let's be clear, <laughs> there will be changes in the guidance. Seattle Public Schools will follow the requirements as outlined in the Department of Health K-12 21-22 school year document, which actually was updated on August 11th. We will be using a layered prevention strategy as Dr. Jones mentioned. So let me just briefly describe what this layered prevention strategy is. It's simply referring to this compound or this additive effect that occurs when you combine preventive strategies rather than relying on one single or just a few strategies. So what are these strategies? The prevention measures include vaccinations, wearing face coverings, staying home when ill, physical distancing, cleaning and disinfecting, hand washing, ventilation and air quality, as well as responding to cases of COVID-19 in the school setting. So I'm going to briefly go over these. Um, while most of these have stayed the same last year, there are some new um, prevention strategies. Some have gone away and we've added, um, there's just been some slight changes to these, which again, as I stated, is found in the DOH guidance. So staying home when sick. One thing you'll notice that um, the Department of Health no longer requires this daily attestation which is what we used last year on an electronic platform to attest or confirm that we don't have any symptoms of COVID-19. However, all of us still need to be responsible and committed to monitoring for symptoms of COVID-19. So Seattle Public Schools is launching a healthy school campaign that will help encourage families in their understanding of the symptoms of COVID-19 and when to stay home if they are ill or experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 or had a close contact um, with somebody with the illness. We know that vaccines remain the most effective strategy available for returning to in full-time in-person learning. So vaccines will be required for staff and volunteers. On August 12th, Dr. Jones directed that all non representative Seattle Public School staff be vaccinated against COVID-19, which was followed by Governor Inslee's directive on August 18th, which legally requires 12 K-12 school district employees to get um, the COVID-19 vaccination or be approved for a medical or religious exemption by October 18th. This is important because we all understand that not all our community are fully vaccinated, especially our younger students under the age of 12 who are not yet eligible for the vaccine. Seattle Public Schools will continue to support vaccine events for our staff, our families and eligible students. And in fact, we'll be hosting an event tomorrow night specific to our staff to get vaccinated or for those who are eligible for a booster. Aside from vaccines, we have learned that wearing a mask or face covering is additionally one of the most imperative or important prevention measures. So the universal and the correct use of wearing a face mask or face covering is still required for all school personnel in the schools, including families, volunteers, or any visitors that are on any of our campuses. It's important to emphasize here the correct wearing of a face mask so we want to make sure that our, our students are coming to school with a multi-layered mask that covers our nose and our mouth that's snug fitting and to the sides of our face. We will have extra masks available for all our staff and students who need them at school because the correct wearing also includes replacing them when they're wet or where they're dirty. 
Next, physical distancing. You'll notice that last year there was cohorting. We are no longer cohorting. However, physical distancing remains still an important preventive measure. So in the classrooms, to the extent possible, to allow for in-person learning, our classrooms have been designed to have a distance of three feet. That is different in common spaces, which is to the extent possible also, um, which is more of six feet. And what are common spaces? Those are like our um, cafeterias or in the hallways or in other areas where we're, we're gathering. But inside the classroom, we've, they've been set up to be at three feet to the extent possible. And we've been able to achieve that in most cases. What else? Responding to cases of COVID-19. This is really important. That's another layering of, um, measure here that will allow us to promptly respond to any suspected or confirmed cases in the school. So one of those is to have a separate room to isolate any student or separate students or, or staff even who are exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19. So we will continue to have what we have identified as a protected health care room, which is specific to separate these ill students or staff until they're able to go home. Contact tracing, really important. So I'm excited that we, the district has committed to continuing to fund our um, COVID central contact tracing team, our central core of nurses who have continued to do this work um, along in partnership with public health to identify any close contacts who have come in um, contact with a student and or staff member, anyone on our campuses that are exhibiting signs of COVID-19. They will continue to work in partnership with public health and consistent with our practices last year, we will notify all close contacts and inform staff in, in the school community as needed. One of the um, additions that I'm excited to um, speak to today is COVID testing. That is really important. And we are excited that we will be offering COVID testing in collaboration with the Washington State Department of Health and the Health Commons Project. We're starting with testing when symptoms arise or following known exposure, which is referred to as diagnostic testing. This testing will help us reduce the spread of COVID-19 with the goal of reducing any lost instructional time for students. The Department of Health Learn to Return testing program follows a go slower to go fast philosophy. So by implementing this diagnostic testing first, we can have immediate positive impacts in serving our school community while learning how best to expand. So once we get the diagnostic testing launched, we'll explore a more robust screening program that will include for students who aren't yet vaccinated or who are at higher risk. So while those weren't all the strategies, I hope you understand how the layering of each one of these, we're not coming to school or work when we're ill, we're wearing our face masks. If we haven't been vaccinated yet, we will, those, I should say this, sorry, those who are eligible will be vaccinated while we wait for those, our youngest, to get vaccinated, followed by increased ventilation and air quality, which I have reserved and saved for Dr. Sarah Pritchard, who will speak beyond um, after me on that, as well as the physical distancing measures, hand hygiene, and the immediate and efficient, timely response to identifying anyone in our school system who's exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19 and working in partnership with public health to isolate and or quarantine and provide information and now testing for anyone in the school who is exhibiting and wants diagnostic testing. As Dr. Jones mentioned, we know that our families and staff are concerned about the Delta variant and our unvaccinated community members, including these students. We will continue to work diligently with public health, the state and OSPI to implement the measures that will help reduce transmission of COVID in our schools. Seattle Public Schools remains committed to following the science and the guidance of our state and local health officials. And we are positioned to adjust with the evolution of this guidance throughout the 21-22 school year. And as a reminder, 
What I do matters, what you do matters, what we do together matters most. And now more than ever, our way forward is together. Thank you for your time. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Pritchett. Thank you, Dr. Nicholson, and good afternoon. I'm Dr. Sarah Pritchett, Assistant Deputy Superintendent for Seattle Public Schools. And I wanna take a few minutes to briefly share with you some of our mitigation strategies and what some of our mitigation strategies look like in buildings and how they may impact how we do school this year. As you know, COVID-19 has had a significant impact on our students, our families, our staff, and our overall operation of schools. While we are returning to in-person school in five days, this year will be different as we start school. The information I'm going to share with you may also help answer some of your urgent questions related to our preparation for the start of school. I'm gonna begin with a, with a new guidance related to school visitors. Starting on September 1st through October 29th, in response to an increase in COVID-19 in our community, all SPS parent meetings with educators will be held virtually via Teams. An example of this would be a meeting regarding progress in a class or an IEP meeting. Those are the types of meetings that we're talking about and appointments that we're talking about. We will share more information soon as we continue to work with our labor partners and receive additional updates from state and local public health experts. Additionally, all visitors to SPS school buildings must make an appointment and vaccination status must be verified. Regular volunteers supporting school operations are also required to, pro to provide full vaccination. I would like to transition now to our HVAC systems, which are less visible, but extremely important, but an extremely important mitigation strategy to help keep our students and staff safe. What I'm gonna talk about is going to be a little bit technical, but if you think about it in this way, in some spaces we are exchanging the air and in some places we are cleaning the air or removing airborne particles. So as we um, come back into school, we are maintaining air quality by managing air circulation and using high performance air filters. MERV 13 filters have been added to HVAC systems that accept them and are being supplemented with freestanding HEPA filters in classrooms and other spaces. The district has also hired an external firm to, ac to access each school building excuse me, to assess each school building, offer air quality recommendations, and support spot checks throughout the school year. In classrooms and common spaces, four to six air exchange will be made per hour based on the occupancy and space size. So again, that goes back to what I was talking about in the beginning, which is the air exchanges mean that we're actually purifying, cleaning the air, or bringing in new air four to six times per hour in classrooms um, and common spaces. And then there will be an addition, and additionally, in um, rooms where more airflow may be needed, there'll be 10 air exchanges per hour. And those rooms may be music rooms or certain types of CT classrooms like woodshop or things that have um, the probability of having more air particles in the air. Moving into our meals, and this is one of our most challenging issues we continue to work through, particularly as, a con as the concerns for the Delta variant continue to rise. In response, we are currently asking all school leaders to review their lunch plans and determine additional ways to extend indoor physical distancing between students to the mass maximum extent possible. Breakfast and lunch will be provided at no cost for all students. Meals will look different in order to follow health and safety protocols and keep in mind, each school layout is unique. And so each has developed their own meal plan, including use of classrooms, outdoor covered areas and tents, gyms, and common spaces. We believe that SPS can, can safely implement lunch plans that allow all students to eat inside with the use of effective prevention strategies, such as maximizing physical distancing, ensuring students aren't facing each other directly, by either staggering seating or having them all face the same direction, maximizing the airflow to meet DOH guidelines. If the system doesn't meet DOH guidelines, we are adding HEPA filters as needed to ensure high quality ventilation. We are also encouraging schools to assign seats for indoor seating or assign fixed groups of students in particular areas. This will also help to support contact tracing. 
at lunchtime, students will be asked to wash their hands before and after eating and also limit the time when their masks are off, only temporarily removing their mask when eating and drinking and then putting their mask right back on. Similar to how some of us do if we've traveled on airlines where we're slipping it off and we're putting it right back on. And we know that this is gonna be hard for our younger students. And so we're looking at this as a teaching opportunity, really teaching into how to properly wear a mask and how to properly remove it and then put it back on while we're eating. We're also encouraging the use of quiet indoor voices and limiting talking to times when your mask is on. Please look out for more information from your student's school regarding their individual plans. Moving into transportation, all students who qualify to receive district transportation will receive transportation. Qualifying for transportation is based on your student's grade level and distance from school. For example, an elementary student who lives one mile from their assigned neighborhood school will receive yellow bus transportation. There may be some delays on, on some yellow bus routes during the start of school while our vendor first student hires and trains more drivers. Tra the transportation department is actively working on alternative options to increase access. In the event of a bus delay, transportation will send a voice or text message to the contact number on file for your student. If you have moved or have a new contact phone number, please update your student's information with our enrollment team and email our transportation department at T-R-A-N-S-D-E-P-T at seattleschools.org with your student's ID number and the new address and phone number. This way we can update your student's route and contact information to ensure the proper bus route assignment and that voice and text messages are being sent to the right contact number. All high school students and some eligible middle school students will receive an ORCA card. Students eligible for ORCA cards may pick them up from their school during orientation or on the first day of school. Information about eligibility for ORCA cards and yellow bus transport for more information on eligibility for ORCA cards and yellow bus transportation, please contact transportation via Let's Talk. The health and safety of our students using district provided transportation is a top priority. Students will physically distance to the greatest extent possible. As students enter yellow buses, they will move to the furthest seat open in the back. Only if each bus seat contains one student will students begin sitting in the same seat. All bus windows will be opened to some extent to provide consistent airflow throughout the bus if doing so will not pose a safety risk. And finally, information on our devices. Schools will be distributing devices, laptops during the first week of school, allowing students to bring their laptops back and forth and allowing us to pivot to remote setting more quickly if needed. Seattle Public Schools is a one-to-one -one serve device district, meaning that we will be providing each student with a grade appropriate iPad or laptop. Your student school will share more details on the distribution before the start of school. At this point, we're going to be opening up for questions. And thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. Uh, here's a question from, from the audience. Uh, when middle and high school students get exposed and have to quarantine, who do we call? Love that question. <laughs> Please call your school. So we have a communication system that's in place and that will initiate the response. Um, as I spoke to earlier, we have that central COVID team of nurses um, and they will um, initiate contact tracing if necessary, if exposure actually happened in the school. So that's part of that investigation process. So please contact your school and that will initiate that um, communication system. Okay, thank you. Here's another question. And I think this one is important because I think there's sometimes there's some misinformation out there, but I wanna ask this question so we can be clear. Uh, one question says that lunch inside, lunch is inside and unmasked at my boys middle school. How can this possibly be safe? What are we actually doing? 
I can take that. Good evening. I'm Carrie Campbell. So we are working to really physically to the extent possible distance our students when unmasked in school in the school building. And as Dr. Pritchett mentioned, we're also really focused on air quality. So making sure that we have strong air exchange over the course of an hour, four to six um, exchanges or cleaning air to that equivalent. We are also asking students to wash hands before and after lunch to, as mentioned, um, temporarily remove masks, especially for those older students who are able to do that and then put it right back on when not eating um, or drinking, as well as minimizing talking. So, and looking at multiple spaces to use across the campus, including some flow out into outdoor spaces if we can't maximize to the fullest extent inside the building. So um, we too are tracking COVID transmission rates, the Delta variant, and are very aware um, of the concerns of families. And as, as educators, we are going to work uh, very hard to keep your children safe while they're in our school buildings and continually adjust our um, approach and our lunch plan is necessary. Thank you so much. A follow-up question to that is, what about safety during band, where presumably some kids will be unmasked playing wind instruments? I can take that. And um, so there is, the DOH does have guidance and there is requirements for um, specialized masks to be worn um, on instruments. So masking will still be required with specialized um, what they call MERV 13 or this three layer mask um, for brass and woodwind instruments. Thank you. A question that just came in. What are the COVID protocols like on school buses? So as Dr. Pritchett described, um, we will load school buses from the front to the back. We will load students in single seats unless they're from um, the same family. We will give space and increase airflow, so crack windows, and then there's a daily um, cleaning protocol. Students will all be masked, and so the universal masking also applies to our buses. Okay, there may be other questions coming in, but those are the extent of the questions that we have thus far. Feel free to ask some more questions. We have a few more minutes. Okay, here's a question that came in. Please define close contact. Who will be notified if there's a positive case? Yeah, that's a tricky one. So right now, the Department of Health, so again, in the same guidance, defines close contact. So generally speaking, it's that six feet um, for 15 minutes, accumulative, accumulative 15 minutes over a 24 hour period. However, there's some nuances to it. One, in the classroom, in the K-12 setting, a close contact would be, um, is less than three feet. So a student who is maintaining that three feet of distance and they're both wearing masks, generally speaking, they would not be considered a close contact. It does not apply to our adults in the classroom, our educators, where six feet of physical distancing um, is required. I do want to say that it's not finite. It's really not that scripted we have to look at other things and that's why we work along in partnership with public health there are other factors to consider in that so close contacts again um, we work with public health and determine um, to the extent of all interactions with anybody with confirmed case um, and identify those close contacts so i just want to be really careful that it just doesn't fit in this nice little box like we want it to it's a little more descriptive than that thank you a couple more questions came in, where and how will testing happen? So testing will, so next year we'll have protected health care rooms as we did last year. Those are rooms where if a child shows COVID symptoms, they are isolated until a parent or caregiver can come to pick them up. It's a supervised space. And through our testing program, we will we have centrally um, staffed flexibility to have someone who can supervise testing. It is a, 
um, tests that can be administered uh, by the student if they're older. So if you want to think about a second grade student all the way up to a senior can self administer the test for our, our littlest learners, our youngest learners. Um, the parent or caregiver actually can administer the test when they arrive and um, as always, uh, testing will require consent when the caregiver or parent comes to pick up the student. And um, the other great thing is, so it's going to be right on site, right there. It might happen outside if um, that is the space that the school has set up so that you drive up to a designated spot. The student is escorted outside. The test is administered and the parent will also be offered a test. Um, so that we're really reducing barriers to COVID testing and increasing the opportunity if it comes back negative and there are no more symptoms that we get your child right back into school and there is less instructional time loss. Thank you once again. All right, the last two questions. Why did SPS discontinue daily attestations? Well, I'll try and answer that. So we have, I, I, I've been proud and, and love doing this work um, with the district's commitment to following the science and the guidance. So I think attestation posed a barrier, maybe perhaps, um, for many districts to, to get kiddos back into schools. So, and I think we learned that um, perhaps it wasn't the most effective um, preventive measure, right? So while we have done away with or we are no longer using that attestation we are emphasizing the daily screening in, of ourselves and our students to make sure that we're not coming in when we're sick as we should have done before covid right so um we know flu season's around the corner so it's important for us to be monitoring our health regardless so that alignment um, with the department of health um, and for other districts across the state and uh, add the additional prevention measures that we have in there. We didn't have vaccines last year, right? So we have a large percentage of our staff who are vaccinated and really proud of the work that we've done to get lots of students vaccinated fully um, by the end of school year. So we are on the right track. There's a prevention or there is a layer of prevention and vaccines. Um, and as um, Carrie noted, this testing strategy, it's a PCR test, so it's highly uh, we can rely on that when our students are, or families are exhibiting symptoms. So these are additional strategies that I think will um, benefit us that we didn't have last year in keeping students um, in school and keeping schools open, and more importantly, keeping us all healthy and safe and reducing the risk of transmission. Healthy and safe is the key. All right, final question. Who do we re reach out to with questions? You can send questions to publicaffairs at seattleschools.org. Um, you can also use, if you go to our website, there's a contact us, it's an orange button, and that goes right to our customer service team, and we will be happy to respond to any questions that are asked. I would also say that your school leaders have all of this information as well. They know what these protocols are going to look like implemented in your child's school context. So questions around lunch planning, um, other mitigation strategies that are being put into place. All of that information are, um, is available at the school level and within your school community context. All right, well, that's going to bring us to a close today. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please join us next week for our virtual town hall focused on high quality learning and student wellness for the 21-22 school year. So if we couldn't answer your question today, our staff will work to respond on those comments. Please use those mechanisms that Carrie just mentioned to uh, so we can follow up with your to answers to your questions. Uh, thank you again. Health and safety are number one priority and we appreciate you. Thank you so much.